Many consider the King of the Hammers to be the toughest one-day race in the world. With speeds of 120 miles an hour across the whooped-out desert, the cars must also navigate through boulder-strewn rock trails, often at violent speeds. The trick is to build a car that can survive. Here's a look at one such car called the UFO and how it was built from start to finish. The UFO is a four-wheel drive mid-engine car using independent front suspension and is able to carry a driver and a navigator. The external dimensions were made as compact as possible because nobody ever said they wished they had a bigger car when navigating through tight rock trails. The two-year build was started in 2009. The project started with a simple Bintech CAD drawing where all the dimensions were established and then converted to a SolidWorks model. The SOLIDWORKS model helps to better see the components and their animation. A bare chassis table is used when it's time to start with something tangible. From here, all of the XYZ coordinates from the models are used to determine where to locate things. Rough placement of components, more models, and laser cut pieces derived from the models. The pieces are then put together like a puzzle and welded up. These particular pieces were used to make up the rear link captures on the chassis. The three sets of holes are used to adjust the rear anti-squat. Next, using the coordinates from the model, the link captures have temporary mounts to locate them to the chassis. Using a bandsaw, drill, and hole saw, I laser cut the tabs without using a laser cutter. Starting on the second floor now with mid rails and their temporary supports. Transmission mounts and engine mounts. The engine mounts are solid and the transmission mounts are, well, almost solid. Did you notice I said engine? I'm going to turn this fat around. It's engine, not motor. And speaking of engines, this engine is an LS7 out of a 2008 Corvette Z06. This car uses a divorce transfer case to keep the passenger seat as low as possible. The front differential housing is welded right to the chassis. No loose bolts here. And here's Jeff the owner saying, hi. The passenger seat is definitely lower now that it doesn't sit on top of the transfer case, but man, I hope the drive shaft doesn't let go. Focusing on the seat mounts, particularly the front seat mounts, which are adjustable. Yeah, I just had my wife say the word particularly because I can't say the word. All of the steel on this car is 4130 chrome molly and TIG welded. These are models of the lower rear control arms, which are 44 inches long. The models also include a fixture for welding them. The fixture not only positions the control arm components, but also, and mainly, helps prevent the arm from warping during the intense welding process. Tabs, tabs, and more tabs. These are the captures for the front control arms. It helps to tack weld pieces like this right to the welding table to keep them from warping when welding. This is a model of the butterfly capture used to locate the upper front shocks on one plane per side. Because of the back and forth forces on shock mounts, the mounts need to be really strong. The hole is for the steering rod. Steering ram mount, and a steering column, and a steering wheel with red buttons. Let's take a closer look at the adjustable steering column with built-in GPS mounts. Okay, starting on the third story now, and BAM! A week later, the top of the roll cage is done. With the lower control arms in place, the upper mounts can be mapped out. 
temporary spacers mounted in mid-air represent where the upper shock mounts will be. Cardboard templates of my design are made to tie it all together and then transferred to chromoly plate. The pieces are welded on the bench and then later welded to the car. The car was designed to place the occupants as far forward as possible with as little forward visual obstruction as possible. Making temporary upper control arm mounts on the axle and it's going to need a winch. Since the accessories need to be mounted way up high to clear the suspension links, I had to make custom brackets. Cracked radiators can be a problem, so nothing was welded to it and instead a mount was made to sandwich the radiator. Well, there was nowhere to go with the headers except up. The stainless steel step headers started at inch and three quarters and went to inch and seven eighths. I really liked the muffler because it had a built-in X-pipe which helped with power and sounded fantastic. But after a backfire it blew the seams out and was replaced with something else. Someone told me that, you know, dude, the front end's going to break right off the car. I did my best to make sure that wasn't going to happen. I made a bunch of these taco shell trusses for tubing which go in various places. At this point the chassis is pretty much done so it's stripped down to its bare form because yay it's coming off the chassis table. We never weighed it but I guess it weighs about 450 pounds. I love making little bits like this. You know, see how light you can make it and still make it strong? This next series of pictures focuses, says, says, focuses on the aluminum dash. It was made with a slip roller and bead roller, then welded up in sections. The material used was 50 thousandths 3003 aluminum. The inspiration came from an early Corvette and the cockpit of an airplane. Jeff, the original owner of the car, did the floor tin and for sure it doesn't suck. The 35 gallon fuel cell, which will later get an aviation type bladder, is held in place with stainless steel straps. I made an in-tank fuel pump holder that mounts two Bosch 044 pumps. It's the best way to eliminate vapor lock. This next series of photos concerns the rear axle and how the upper link captures were trussed into the housing. At crunch time, towards the end of the project, I had my friend Rusty come and help out. He's an excellent fabricator. The oval window is not for weight reduction, but is there to give dimensional rigidity. In my opinion, it gives it a kind of funky UFO-y look. When I first started the project, I was like an okay welder, but by the time the project was done, I was pretty decent. Full droop and full compression. Sparkly. Have you ever made cinch bungs? Well, this is how I did it with a slit saw in a mill. All that fabrication just to hold a heat exchanger. This next series of picks is what I call the ridiculous battery box. I'm just going to zip through them.
you won't find one of these chromoly battery boxes in the Summit catalog. It's a vacuum cleaner, I mean air cleaner. The dash was too shiny, so it got powder coated. And look, it's on tires. The obligatory full bump pick. We actually drove it around like this for a while. I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but Hardline was used whenever it seemed like it was a good idea. At the time of this build, HID lights were still king and LED lights were just breaking into the scene. Jeff also did a great job installing the black UHMW skid plates, which is great for sliding over rocks. This is the regulation one inch vent line that eliminates any fuel spillage no matter what the attitude of the car is. The Super 14 differential is based on a Chevy 14 bolt but is made of aluminum and is of dropout design similarly to a Ford 9 inch. Spare tire rack. Oh, these clever little saddles for mounting brake lines. Let's see how much time I can waste making a footrest for the passenger. As you can tell, this video is more about raw fabrication as opposed to showcasing stuff that was bought. I mean, because anybody can just buy bolt-on bling. Jeff started racing the car in 2011. I was his first co-driver, and I admit I'm terrible at it. At first, he drove the car very conservatively. In other words, he drove it like he paid for it, which is totally understandable considering it's a $180,000 car. Over the five years he owned it, however, he got really fast and competitive. But race cars are expensive to own and maintain, and since he was ready to retire, he'd had enough and sold the car. I made some breakaway mirrors based off of a cam detent design. Later, I started a small entity called Race Mirror and sold hundreds of spring-loaded breakaway mirrors for off-road cars. Getting towards the end of the build now with only a few hurdles left. One of them was the hood. I made this out of several pieces of aluminum that were welded together. It also incorporated a scoop tunnel that supplied air to the power steering cooler. When it was all sanded down, it looked like one piece. Shout out to ProWire for doing the wiring. Boy, that stuff is expensive, but when you want it done right, She's looking sexy now, and she's finally in the dirt. From left to right, Heath, the shock tuner, Jeff, the owner, Dan, Mr. SolidWorks, and me. In 2013, the car was featured in Dirt Sports Magazine's Masterpiece in Metal section. Here's some pro shots taken in the studio. There's a little video of it running at the end, but basically, we're done. Thanks for watching and please subscribe and like.
the right one. <laughs> yeah.